Now we're going to start talking about molecular components that make up the cell and one of the most important molecular components that is very relevant to cell signaling networks is the plasma membrane. This is the barrier that I talked about when we talked about agents in general having a barrier. This is the barrier of the human or mouse cell and it it's made of a lipid bilayer that this movie explains in a little bit more detail. Between the living machinery of the inner cell and the harsh conditions of the outside world stands the cell's plasma membrane. As crucial as this barrier is, it's surprisingly flexible. Push it and watch it move. Poke hard enough and it might break and begin to regroup. The lipid molecules of the membrane naturally assemble in a double layer because their tails repel water as their heads attract it. Throw in some cholesterol and a few carbohydrates and you have the basic structure of a plasma membrane. Within these lipid molecules, we also find different proteins which do various things for the cell. For instance, they receive signals from the world outside or they transport nutrients and waste. So nature composes the membrane with a combination or mosaic of different lipids, carbohydrates, and proteins. And these molecules are not stationary. They constantly move within the structure, fluidly changing their positions. The survival of all life rests on this veil of material. A supple membrane, just two molecules thick. So some of the systems that we're going to discuss is the cell signaling network that takes information from the environment and passes, transduce that information into the cell through cell signaling pathways such as this MAP kinase pathway that we're just going to watch and those signals are forming a network and then informing the cell of the status of the environment and helping the cell to make the final phenotypic decision. This MAP kinase pathway it's probably one of the most famous well-studied pathways in molecular biology. However, you have to keep in mind that in this animation, the processes are highly simplified and it seems like there is only one pathway and one cascade that is going at once. However, you have to keep in mind that there are many other proteins and players in this pathway and this process that are not visualized. MAPK signaling is activated through binding of a growth factor to the extracellular domain of the tyrosine kinase receptor. Signaling molecules GRB2 and SOS are next recruited to the internal docking site, resulting in RAS activation at the membrane. The efficiency and duration of signal transmission is regulated by the scaffolding protein kinase suppressor of RAS, KSR. RAS triggers a phosphorylation cascade involving RAF, MEC and ERK proteins, leading to ERK activation and translocation to the nucleus. Once in the nucleus, ERK activates several transcription factors that mediate gene expression. Target genes thus activated by MAPK signaling contribute to higher proliferation and survival. Another very important pathway is the PI3 kinase pathway, which is important for making the decision to stay alive. PI3K signaling is initiated by the growth factor binding to the tyrosine kinase receptor leading to receptor dimerization. As a consequence, lipid kinase PI3K is recruited to the internal docking site and becomes activated. PI3K next converts membrane lipid PIP2 to its active PIP3 form, which in turn leads to activation of a key signaling kinase, AKT. AKT promotes cell growth through protein synthesis driven by mTOR signaling and reduces cell death by blocking FOXO activity. And this is the 
visualization and explanation of two apoptosis pathways, one through an intrinsic signal of DNA damage and the other through an extracellular signal through a TNF receptor. Two signaling mechanisms exist for activation of apoptosis, an intrinsic mechanism and an extrinsic mechanism. In the intrinsic pathway, cell death may be triggered through DNA damage or severe cell stress. Following activation, intracellular pro-apoptotic proteins are released to activate caspases. This ultimately results in apoptosis, a process commonly blocked in tumor cells. Restoring the intrinsic apoptotic pathway after it has been inactivated may promote tumor cell death. The extrinsic pathway is activated in response to diverse external signals, such as APO2L trail. This pathway has the potential to induce death of tumor cells independently of the intrinsic pathway. Development of novel molecules that promote apoptosis by targeting both pathways of apoptosis, intrinsic and extrinsic, advances the understanding of the mechanisms behind tumor cell proliferation. So one of the most exciting areas of research now, systems biology and in biology in general, is this concept of epigenetics. We already know the DNA sequence of a human or a mouse cell, but the question remains to understand how the, those genes that are expressed in our cells are regulated. And epigenetics is the field that tries to understand that at the chromatin level. So the DNA is coiled in chromatin, and that chromatin is regulated by signals from the environment, and this enables the recruitment of proteins that regulate the expression of genes, and the expression of those genes give rise to the cell phenotype. In this particular movie, we're going to look at how the chromatin is organized and how post-translational modifications can be, lead to the reorganization of the chromatin structure. The tails of core histones labeled here can be altered with distinct chemical modifications, including methylation of histone H3, acetylation of histone H4, and phosphorylation of histone H2B. Euchromatin is often characterized by a more open and accessible state of the DNA, one in which transcription factors have access to their cognate binding sites and can therefore recruit enzymes like histone acetyltransferases that acetylate histone tails and activate genes by recruiting components of the basal transcriptional machinery, including RNA polymerase. Heterochromatin, in contrast, is thought to be characterized by a more repressive, tight bundling of nucleosomes, which impedes transcription factors from gaining access to regulatory sites on the DNA. Methylation of cytosine bases in regions called CPG islands is a hallmark of transcriptionally repressed heterochromatin. These methylated cytosines in turn recruit proteins like MECP2, methyl CPG binding protein 2, and HP1, heterochromatin protein 1. These proteins are thought to maintain a repressive state of chromatin by inducing histone deacetylation by HDACs, as well as histone tail methylation by histone methyltransferase enzymes. A very important concept that we're going to discuss in the upcoming lectures is the concept of transcription factors. Transcription factors are proteins that can bind to the DNA directly and regulate the expression of genes. In the nucleus, DNA is condensed into a DNA protein complex called chromatin. In places where genes are being expressed, there are often zones of naked DNA. We will now explore ways that transcription factors interact with these zones. 
Even among scientists, a common misperception is that transcription factors fall from the sky onto the DNA and test one spot at a time. Such a process is too inefficient. Instead, the transcription factor interacts non-specifically with the DNA backbone. This allows it to efficiently search the DNA for its binding site, a DNA sequence it recognizes. The transcription factor slides along until it encounters its binding site. Then it changes conformation to interact specifically with nucleotides on the interior of the helix. Now the transcription factor can stay and interact with other proteins for transcription. Or it can become dislodged by many factors, which could include movement of the DNA or interaction with other proteins. Studies have suggested that transcription factors sometimes move from one part of the DNA to another. Short hops might allow them to bypass other proteins or to hop over compacted sections of DNA. When the transcription factor lands on another segment of DNA, short hops become big jumps. Although the other strand is nearby in three-dimensional space, it may be much farther away on the chromosome or on another chromosome entirely. There are 1500 different types of transcription factors in human cells. They interact to create a complex language of gene expression. Once these transcription factors have assembled a complex near genes, transcription can uh, begin and this movie show you the process of transcription a process where a DNA sequence is translated into an mRNA molecule and then this mRNA molecule will give rise to a protein. What you are about to see is DNA's most extraordinary secret. How a simple code is turned into flesh and blood. It begins with a bundle of factors assembling at the start of a gene. A gene is simply a length of DNA instruction stretching away to the left. The assembled factors trigger the first phase of the process, reading off the information that will be needed to make the protein. Everything is ready to roll. Three, two, one, go. The blue molecule racing along the DNA is reading the gene. It's unzipping the double helix and copying one of the two strands. The yellow chain snaking out of the top is a copy of the genetic message and it's made of a close chemical cousin of DNA called RNA. The building blocks to make the RNA enter through an intake hole. They are matched to the DNA, letter by letter, to copy the A's, C's, T's, and G's of the gene. The only difference is that in the RNA copy, the letter T is replaced with a closely related building block known as U. You are watching this process called transcription in real time. It's happening right now in almost every cell in your body. The final uh, movie is about the protein translation process. In this particular movie, we will see how the mRNA molecule is exiting the nucleus after it's been translated, and then through the ribosomes, the mRNA molecule is giving the information needed for the ribosome to assemble a new protein. And those proteins, as you've seen earlier, have many functions including signaling but also giving rise to the structure and function of all workings of the cell. The job of this mRNA is to carry the gene's message from the DNA out of the nucleus to a ribosome for production of the particular protein that this gene codes for. 
there can be several million ribosomes in a typical eukaryotic cell. These complex catalytic machines use the mRNA copy of the genetic information to assemble amino acid building blocks into the three-dimensional proteins that are essential for life. Let's see how it works. The ribosome is composed of one large and one small subunit that assemble around the messenger RNA, which then passes through the ribosome like a computer tape. The amino acid building blocks, that's the small glowing red molecules, are carried into the ribosome attached to specific transfer RNAs. That's the larger green molecules also referred to as tRNA. The small subunit of the ribosome positions the mRNA so that it can be read in groups of three letters known as a codon. Each codon on the mRNA matches a corresponding anticodon on the base of a transfer RNA molecule. The larger subunit of the ribosome removes each amino acid and joins it onto the growing protein chain. As the mRNA is ratcheted through the ribosome, the mRNA sequence is translated into an amino acid sequence. There are three locations inside the ribosome, designated the A site, the P site, and the E site. The addition of each amino acid is a three-step cycle. First, the tRNA enters the ribosome at the A site and is tested for a codon-anticodon match with the mRNA. Next, provided there is a correct match, the tRNA is shifted to the P site and the amino acid it carries is added to the end of the amino acid chain. The mRNA is also ratcheted on three nucleotides or one codon. Thirdly, the spent tRNA is moved to the E site and then ejected from the ribosome to be recycled. As the protein synthesis proceeds, the finished chain emerges from the ribosome. It folds up into a precise shape determined by the exact order of amino acids. Thus, the central dogma explains how the four-letter DNA code is, quite literally, turned into flesh and blood. There is a really amazing video that was created uh, in the 70s by people from Stanford where they animated the process of protein translation in a dance. So this is it for talking about the biological concepts that you would need in this course. However, I would like to encourage you to continually study the field and this will help you if you ever have a, uh, the opportunity to work with biologists it would be very important that you can speak their language and understand the problems that they are facing at a high level of detail.